Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending August 30th. This first article was sent in by Navy Thomas 8. It's actually an almost hour-long documentary called Drone Warfare Extermination by Remote Control. But the part I would like to concentrate on, and I'll put just a little bit of the video up here, is the part where these drones flying at, I don't know what kind of altitudes are, 10,000 feet, something like that, can take a panoramic view of an entire city and then by sending the image back to a remote location you can zoom in on these locations and see such detail as individual cars it actually tracks the cars with uh, putting little squares around them you can even see and zoom up on people walking across walkways now this is kind of the same technology and uh, I'm not going to put the audio part of it on here because I'll probably get dinged for copyright and even though I always fight it and win it uh, it ends up just not being worth it so uh, I'll just play the uh, uh, visual video part but uh, the guy describes on this documentary how they use just uh, regular uh, the same type of sensors that are on your uh, smartphone type of camera those same kind of sense optical sensors that are behind the lens but they just use many many of them and then use software to stitch these images together and you get an ultra high def um, view of these different places but uh, in real time video and you can just keep zooming and zooming and zooming up I'm thinking since uh, Part of this they show is covered up, part of this, uh, the equipment in this drone is covered up in tarps and they say it's classified. They don't want uh, the information to fall into enemy hands, but to give you enough detail, my guess is that if this is what they're showing us as far as the resolution, it's probably maybe even two times better or maybe even ten times better than what we're actually seeing. This is also similar to something I've been involved in myself, although I've never actually did it. I've uh, looked up a lot of articles and I think I did a past story on it. When you, uh, for example, on your camera, if it has a panoramic setting, you'll actually scan from side to side with your camera and it will stitch the photographs together and say if your camera is a 7 megapixel camera, your resulting image will be something like 21 megapixels or maybe 28 megapixels stitched together. Well, if you could consider panoramas like that stacked one on top of the other with the same 7 megapixel sensor on your camera, just stitching the photographs together, you could take... Uh, an optical resolution photograph that was hundreds of millions of pixels or or maybe even a billion or more like uh, like this is doing in real-time video so that the principle has already been used and people with really sophisticated equipment and jigs can make these ultra high les resolution photographs and even post them online to where you keep zooming in and zooming in and zooming into where things that look like little dots in the background you can zoom in and see the details of somebody's face so they're using the same thing in drone warfare and flying around in a, with real-time video. This is pretty fantastic. If you uh, go to about that 30-minute, I think the it's about the 30-minute and 30-second part, if you just want to look on this documentary of the part that I'm talking about, about the ultra-high-resolution zoom-in effect. But uh, it is pretty impressive. So thank you, Navy Thomas 8, for sending this in. Um, the next article is the Air Dog. I did talk about that before. It's one of those drones that's for sale to the public. Now, this is a, a regular drone, but this one is kind of nice. It's got some features. They started as a Kickstarter project, and they asked for $200,000, and they zoomed past a million dollars like in no time at all. So um, this thing was going to market. And the original price they were going to sell it for was just under $1,500. Now they've reduced the price to $1,295. It was $1,495. Now it's down to $1,295, and they're promising a December delivery. And you can also, on the sites that I'm going to give you, you can see some video. And uh, you don't necessarily need a smartphone. You can get some extra features out of it if you have a smartphone, but it has a tether with it. And you can do some limited programming. You put the uh, drone in a position you want, following you or off to the side of you, and tell it to stay in that relative position. And then as you move on a motorcycle or a surfboard or a bicycle, whatever, this is, drone will stay in the same position and do pretty much the equivalent of helicopter-type shots, the uh, quality and the movements are very impressive in fact I think in the future we're gonna see a lot of movie studios instead of paying for helicopter rental time they're gonna probably buy some sophisticated versions of these drones and use those for doing movies in the future next up this is something that is close by me this is Fermilab thank you uh, 1954 shadow for sending this in do we live in a 2d hologram new Fermilab experiment will test the nature of the universe um, to make it more exciting, I think they talk about the fact of 2D versus 3D, but um, basically it all boils down to, if you don't want to read all the details in the articles, I'll sum it up for you. They're doing a laser interferometer type of experiment, and what they're trying to determine is, does the fabric of the universe itself, does it actually exist in discrete um, little spaces? 
the the way I could explain it best is remember the old TV sets and even the newer TV sets if you've got a good enough magnifying glass you go up to them and that nice smooth picture is actually painted on a canvas of little discrete dots well they're wondering if the fabric of space itself is little discrete dots in other words is there a limit uh, to how much information outer space itself can contain so in other words when you get to a certain closeness in the universe a particle has to exist either here or there and it can't exist or be in a place that's in between because there is no in between there is no there there so it's little discrete sections just like discrete pixels well they're going to run this experiment by shooting these laser beams about 40 foot down and then bring them back around and join them back up again and by checking with the interference and uh, other details of the experiment which I won't get into you can you can read uh, there's a lot more side articles you can read about yourself if you want every little minute detail but just boiling it down to the fact of if they run this long enough and get good enough data and can weed out the uh, interference and stuff from the outside they may be able to determine if the fabric of our universe is actually in little discrete uh, 2D type of pixel uh, configuration as far as the, the fabric of the universe itself that particles and wave exist inside of. And last up, this is from Science Alert. Common gut bacteria could treat food allergies. Uh, they've been finding out more and more that overuse of antibiotics on uh, children especially have been having some pretty bad effects and because peanut allergies have been really on the rise they believe now compared uh, by testing this on uh, mice right now they're testing it there's a bacteria called I'll see if I can pronounce this right Clostridia I believe it's pronounced and these Clostridia bacteria are a helpful bacteria that live in people's guts well in the case of children that use too many antibiotics it kills off a lot of the helpful bacteria along with the bad bacteria and these Clostridia evidently put a coating on your intestine to not allow the protein factors of the peanuts to pass from your intestines into your bloodstream and cause allergic reactions so by giving kids a cocktail of uh, these type of probiotics that contain Clostridia they may be able to actually get rid of the effects of peanut allergies kind of leads me to believe although I'm definitely not up on this stuff whatsoever but it leads me to believe that it may be that most all human beings are prone to peanut allergy but just because of the fact we have uh, the particular right type of gut bacteria that's helpful to us is why we're not really allergic to that or some other things um, this also gets into another thing that I've uh, really been having some contention about with especially friends on Facebook uh, they said uh, there may be some offshoots of these uh, good bacteria in your system too that can relate to people that have obesity anxiety disorders and autism um, I'm one that really will answer back if somebody posts on Facebook some of these ridiculous claims that oh people that get vaccinated vaccines cause autism because they have thimerosal in it which is a, a mercury type of compound um, there's still been no legitimate studies that I've ever seen that have ever linked them together and to me the final nail in the coffin of the thimerosal is if you explored Denmark back in 1992 there were no longer any thimerosal compounds in vaccines given to children so there's been 21 years of no thimerosal in the vaccines whatsoever so why didn't the autism rates drop as a matter of fact the autism rates are going up at about the same exact rate as they are in the United States and now um, the overall autism rate increases is three factors two of the factors is not anything to do with autism actually increasing one of the factors is is saying that autism is increasing which I believe it actually is but it's not increasing in an alarming rate it's increasing in a concerned uh, and, a, and a rate to be concerned about I would say the first factor is diagnosis especially in the early 90s changed and a lot of kids that were labeled mentally retarded were re-diagnosed at a later time and given the diagnosis of autism there's also the diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder means a child is basically normal but maybe one or two small minor factors which would not affect them you know having a normal life are similar to autism or within the realm of autism that's called autism spectrum disorder the other thing is the fact that there are some certain peaks too because children between the ages of one and six are very much not prone to being diagnosed with autism especially very young children it's only when children are past the age of six that they usually end up getting that diagnosis so some of the peaks that you'll see in some of these things too are due to when the diagnosis takes place but the other one-third of the factor um, has nothing to do with the diagnosis changing or anything like that it does seem to be that legitimately autism is on the rise but uh, I think the Denmark study has probably put the nail in the coffin about thimerosal because if it hasn't been around for 21 years there should have been a tremendous drop if not at least a slight drop in autism rates in Denmark and it's not happening so 
Um, I think we need to get on with other studies such as this one here. It may be something to do with uh, environment. It may be something to do with what we eat. It may be do something to do with gut bacteria like in this article here. And so uh, I wish everybody would really get off of this uh, vaccine thing and get on to something so we can really discover the true cause of the increase in autism and do something to help these kids rather than just panicking everybody about vaccines, which uh, is, is uh, absolutely not needed. So anyway, that's it for this week. Take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.